All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining um, AUCD for this webinar this afternoon, Every Student Succeeds Act, Ensuring Equity in State Plan Development and Implementation. The reason why we put this webinar together um, is basically comes from our AUCD's Public Policy Committee. The last time our Public Policy Committee met, um, we were our, our committee was discussing the state plan development, and uh, I, I, I asked if it would be helpful to the committee and uh, if the committee would like to sponsor a webinar to help the um, AUCD network understand more about the process of developing the state plans and to hear from experts in, in the field that are doing the most work in analyzing the state plans as they are being developed from the point of view of students with disabilities. So I asked my colleagues on the uh, Consor Consortium for Citizens with Disabilities Task Force, Candace Cortilla, Cortilla, sorry, and Ricky Sabia, um, whom I've, I've known for quite some time and worked with um, for many years, um, uh, to join this webinar and help to uh, help to educate our network about uh, state plan development. Um, both of them have been very involved in analyzing the state plans as the drafts has been coming out. They, um, it's been fantastic to, to um, have them as a resource um, given that they're watch, watching this so closely. Um, so uh, let me just make a very brief uh, introduction and then we'll go forward. But, but first, I want to make sure everybody was aware that their mics are muted for now. We'll have the, uh, we'll open the mics at the very end for, for questions um, and answers. Um, and, and then we'll, we'll also have a survey at the end. Uh, so first of all, um, Candice is the founder and director of the Advocacy Institute, which is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to the development of projects products and services that work to improve the lives of people with disabilities. And she's been working in the disability rights field for over 25 years, serving as a parent advocate, a trainer, and an expert on special education policy. Uh, Ricky has worked for over two decades as an advocate on the federal, state, and local lo levels, um, most specifically for individuals with Down syndrome, but also other developmental disabilities and has emphasized um, work on education policy. And her, her son, Steve, actually worked in the AUCD office. And I see here from your bio um, that he's now working on policy um, for, ND, uh, for ND, the National Down Syndrome Congress, um, which is fantastic uh, to see. So uh, I work with both Ricky and Candace on the Education Task Force, and um, I really appreciate them taking the time out of their day to, to help our network understand the plan development. So I'm going to hand it over to both of you. OK, this is Ricky Sabia. I am going to be starting this presentation. OK, so um, the Every Student Succeed Act Succeeds Act, which I hope you're all familiar with, was signed in December of 2015. It reauthorized the Elementary, Secondary, and Education Act, which was also called the No Child Left Behind Act. So it replaces the No Child Left Behind Act and ended on um, the ESEA waivers that came during the time that the No Child Left Behind Act was the law. The states were permitted to submit waiver applications. Um, required to do certain things in order to get waivers of certain aspects of the requirements. And uh, when this law, ESSA, came into place last August 2016 was when those waivers uh, uh, no longer had any effect. So the purpose of the Act, and this is really important because it's the thing that I think states are often forgetting when they develop their plans, is that it's supposed to provide all children significant opportunity to receive a fair, equitable, and high quality education and to close education achievement gaps. So while a lot of states are looking at this application, this template that they're submitting, and as a way to get funding 
from ESSA. They look at it as an application for funding. The point of getting the funding is to make sure this purpose is achieved. And that's why we are so strong in advocating that they must do everything that's in the law to make certain that what is happening in their state with that money ends up with this, all children getting the significant opportunity for a fair, high quality, equitable, and high quality education and to close achievement gaps. So there's a requirement that plans, once states develop them, be submitted and approved by the U.S. Department of Education to receive the funds. There were two windows to submit the plans. The first one was April 3rd, and then they got an extension to May 3rd because a new template application was put out, and they wanted to give them some more time to use it. And then the next, and there were 16 states and District of Columbia that submitted at that point. And then September 18th will be the next time when all the rest of the states will be submitting their plans. So a lot of these plans are now going to be coming out um, for the 30-day review for public comment and then 30 days review for the governor in the next couple of months. So as I said, 60 states of D.C., you can see on this map uh, which of the states have been submitted for the April deadline. And they're in the process of going through review. You said the Department of Ed has 120 days to approve submitted plans. There have already been three, the, that Nevada, New Mexico, and Delaware, that the U.S. Department of Education has put out their peer review analysis and also asked the state to revise their plan and provide some more information on certain points brought up by the peer reviewers. If you go, this happened after we had done these slides, so I don't have a link directly for you, but if you Google as a plan submission, you will come up with a link that you could go to, and it will have a list of all the states and D.C., and if you click on the states, it will take you to the page where there is their plan is posted, and if there were peer review comments posted yet or letters to the states posted, you will find them there. We do have to point out that of these 17 plans, about Five of them were accessible, and all the rest were not in accessible format. They were posted in you know, a PDF version that could not be accessed for disability purposes. So that's a big problem that we brought to the federal government's attention. So as we said, remaining states will submit September 18th. Approximately 75% of students with disabilities are educated in the states submitting in September. So in other words, we've got California, New York, Texas, Pennsylvania, and uh, Florida, you know, some of the bigger states that educate the most of the kids of the country, so that's critically important. 58% um, of IDA eligible students are also served by Title I, so that's very important. A lot of times people, you know, that represent in students with disabilities, they're very focused on IDA, but do not give enough focus to ESSA. And the percent served by both vary state by state from a lower 12% to 85% or more in these other states. But there is a large overlap. The status of all state plans is available at these at the understandingessa.org, and then we'll be talking about a review guide where we have additional links. So one very important piece about the requirements under the law is that these Title I state plans are supposed to be developed with timely and meaningful consultation with all the people and, or, and agencies that are listed here. And of course, parents is down there at the bottom. And when we had the regulations, which were since repealed, they specifically mentioned disability or civil rights and disability organizations. But nonetheless, in order to develop a plan with all the stakeholders, they really do need to include parents of students with disabilities and or agent, the organizations that represent them. And this has been something we have not seen happening. I mean, it's also been a problem for other groups as well that represent kids of color and uh, English learners, but the biggest problem has been in terms of consultation with parents 
of students with disabilities. A lot of times, 22 states, I think, have PTA members, but they don't necessarily have a child with disability, or nor are they necessarily uh, taking comments or reaching out to that population. So it also requires that the state plan is coordinated with other programs under this act, and, and here you will see a list, including IDEA, of the various other laws that ESSA is supposed to be coordinated with. So that's a very important piece as you review plans, you know, that they are supposed to be taking all this into account. So this is the guide I was talking about earlier where there are more links for you. And so the Advocacy Institute and NDSC developed this guide based on the way we were, have been reviewing and analyzing plans. So we have analyses of certain state plans, but since we can't do all of them, we wanted to provide state organizations with a guide to help them walk through the key provisions of their state plan so that they are able to comment meaningfully uh, in the time period that's allotted to do so. And so this is based on the March 2017 pl state plan template. There had been an earlier state plan template, and then that was the Department of Ed then put out another one in March. And it's very limited in what it requires, but we are encouraging states to put in more information and more detail to ensure that they are, in fact, meeting the purpose of the law. And there is a link for you to, to get that guide. Okay, so one of the important things within the law is subgroup accountability. So as started with No Child Left Behind, it became an issue that it's not enough for a school as a whole to do well because a lot of groups are being swept under the rug because on average the school looked like students were doing well, that they needed to also disaggregate data both for reporting but also for accountability purposes for each major racial and ethnic group, for economically disadvantaged students, for children with disabilities, and English learners. And that students are supposed to count in every applicable subgroup. So they're not supposed to have unduplicated counts. They're supposed to, if you are a child who is black, has a disability, and economically disadvantaged, you are supposed to be counted in each of those subgroups. And also, Unlike those ESCA flexibility requests that we talked about earlier um, that allowed combining of subgroups, that now the law says that they cannot combine subgroups, that each of these separate subgroups has to count for uh, reporting as well as for accountability. And then additional groups can be added <coughs> Excuse me, um, at the state's discretion, for example, that some states do gifted students. Also, ESSA adds the requirement to report disaggregated data on, and this is just for reporting, not accountability, on uh, homeless students, students in foster care, and students who have a parent in the armed services. So minimum subgroup size is one of our key issues as we analyze these plans. We consider it a gateway issue because if, you're, if the school for assessment purposes does not have enough students in the assessed grades who have disabilities, then that school and how those students do will not be counted towards whether or not the school needs targeted or comprehensive support and improvement. And the same applies for if the graduating class in a high school does not have enough students with disabilities to meet or exceed the end size, then there will not be subgroup accountability. Uh, for students with disabilities. So this end size is very important just to get the students counted at all. Then we care about some of these other provisions and what happens, you know, if the subgroup, some of the performing and the rest. But if they're not even in the accountability system as a subgroup, then none of the rest even matters. So this is very important. So one of the things that we see in when we look at all the state plans we've looked at so far is that there is a wide range of end sizes going from zero in New Mexico to 30 in California, Michigan, North Carolina, New York. We just saw today Missouri. But most are setting lower end sizes for reporting than for accountability. So then we need they need to look at how the minimum number of students was determined by 
the state, including, and this is really important, how the state collaborated with teachers, principals, other school leaders, parents, and other stakeholders when determining such minimum number. And the problem here is that they're saying they consulted with all these groups, but there is no evidence, uh, first of all, that representatives of disability subgroup have been consulted with, and on top of that, that there is no information in many states about what is the impact of the end size for that state on the number of schools that will be included or excluded for subgroup accountability, for assessment and graduation rate, due to the end size. So the end size really, how it has an impact is very dependent on the state. For example, you could have a lower end size like 20 in a state like Vermont that could exclude a lot of schools because they have such small schools. In another state that has larger schools, it may not exclude as many students. So it's very important for each state to provide information to stakeholders on what will be the impact, what will be the percent of schools that will be excluded from subgroup accountability for assessment and graduation rate, as well as the percent of students across the state that will not be in a school where there is subgroup accountability. So end size for assessment, so that's the number of students across the grades assessed required for a school to have the assessment results separately for English language arts and math to be included in the accountability system. So if your school has 29 students in the assessed grades for ELA, just say, and the end size for the state is 30, then there will not be subgroup accountability for the accountability system. They, if that school just say would have had poor enough performance to get targeted support and improvement plan, if there have been 30 kids, the fact that there's 29 will keep that from happening. Now, they are still counted in the all student group, but one of the big benefits of this focus on the subgroups is to really hone in on what subgroups need to support, even if the all student group looks okay. So the fact that they're in the all student group, if they say, well, they're still counted, they're in the all student group, that is really not sufficient to get at what we need. So this is an example of the way you may see in a state plan, uh, if they do provide data, the data on percent of students included in school accountability based on various end sizes. So you can see here, this state provided diff these different end sizes, and then for students with disabilities, they showed the percent of schools that would that would be included in the disability um, that would be included in accountability, and you can see, obviously, the higher the end size is, the fewer schools are going to be included. End size for graduation, as I said earlier, now you're looking at the number of students in the graduating class for a high school. In order to have the graduation rate have an impact in the accountability system for students with disabilities. And again, you know, the students will count in the all-student graduation rate, even if it's the number of students is below the end size, but that is not going to get at the targeted support that students with disabilities may need. And so this is another example of graduation rate and students with disabilities, and this is for an end size of 20. They're not here, here they're not showing you what it would be at different end sizes, but they are showing you what it would be um, if it was 20, which is what they selected. Oh, I'm sorry, I think I missed. Did I miss the poll? Yeah, we missed it, but we'll we'll um, do it at the end. We'll do it at the end. I'm sorry. I just blanked That's, on that poll. That's okay. <laughs> so, um, Anna, can you give me the slides now? You have them now. Okay. Okay, got it. Okay, so this is Candace Cordiella. Thanks uh, so much for to AUCD for having us today. We're thrilled to be here with you and have some uh, people who are interested in this topic. So I'm going to talk about a couple of other ESSA requirements um, and discuss issues that we have found. As Ricky mentioned earlier, 
the guide that we've prepared really has um, the, the tips for you to use in working through each of these issues what, um, and the provisions. What we're trying to do today is, is give you a, an overview of what we're seeing a lot in the landscape um, and what issues are arising. Um, and then we've identified some of them in the, in the guide and given you way, ways to go about seeking uh, to explore those with your state if you find those issues in your draft plan. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is another key requirement of ESSA, which is setting of long-term goals and measurements of interim progress. Measurements of interim progress is uh, something that you might recall from No Child Left Behind, known as AMOs, or Annual Measurable Objectives. So the measurements of interim, interim progress um, replace what we used to know as uh, AMOs in NCLB. So the states have to establish ambitious long-term goals and measurements of interim progress for all students and for each subgroup of students at a minimum for academic achievement, and that's, that's measured by grade level proficiency on the um, annual assess state assessments in reading and math, and for high school graduation rates. A lot of states are choosing to set goals for other uh, pieces of their assessment system, but the, these are the two that they have to do, and they have to do them at the subgroup level, and they have to do them every year of the timeline that they're uh, putting forward for their for their for the goal period. So, and we're already seeing um, that states. This is one of the things that states are failing regularly to to supply. The goals must take into account improvement necessary to make significant progress in closing statewide gaps in proficiency and graduation. Okay, so now I've lost my little thing. Okay, uh, so. Here are some of the issues that we are seeing as we've gone through a lot of the state plans. First of all, few states are making a commitment to hold the goals or the, or the target steady. Um, only one state that we've reviewed so far, the state of Maryland, explicitly commits to maintaining goals over time. And in fact, a lot of states are incorporating language into their plan that says that they clearly intend to um, you know, review their goals based on actual performance over their the timeline of their goals, which you know we'll we'll talk about that, what that might lead to. Uh, the timelines that are being offered by this uh, by the states to accomplish these goals range significantly across the states from uh, from six years to twenty years. Um, and in fact, as, as some of our uh, the bloggers over at Education Week, uh, said in one of their blogs that, you know, in some states we're talking about children who haven't even been born yet. So uh, 20 years is probably too long of a time to be laying out uh, goals for for achievement. Oops, let me see where I am now. Okay. Um, the, the, I'll give you an example of this in a minute. The goals that we're seeing set for students with disabilities reflect significant progress in a lot of cases that uh, are not representative of past performance or rate of improvement and are not supported by activities to accomplish these goals. We're talking here about proficiency in uh, reading and math and graduation rates. And I think what we're likely to see happen as a result of this is that the, re that the goals will be revised downward uh, go as, as we go along over this timeline um, in order to align them with actual achievement. So in fact, the excuse will be you know, we're not we're not getting the students with disabilities to those uh, targets, so we're going to adjust them downward. So it's kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, in a lot of ways. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, and I'll give you an example of this in a minute as well. The goals for academic proficiency for students with disabilities and graduation rates are not aligned at all. And there are several states that are wonderful examples of this. Uh, some states are proposing to, to measure academic achievement by scale scores instead of proficiency. And the statute is quite clear that the measurement of academic achievement is based on proficiency rates on statewide assessments. These states, um, specifically Connecticut and Colorado, have taken the position that they just simply don't like that way of measuring um, academic achievement and have um, submitted their plans without the, without the use of those measures. So we're anxiously awaiting to see how the department is going to 
respond to them. They can certainly, states are certainly able to use scale scores, and we understand the, uh, you know, the, the, the interest in scale scores as opposed to proficiency rates. Um, but, and they can certainly use them in addition to proficiency rates, but they can't use them instead of. Many states are failing to provide baseline data, in other words, where, the, where every um, group uh, is starting with their proficiency and, and their graduation rates. They're failing to provide long-term goals, they're failing to provide goals by subgroup, and they're failing to provide their, inter, their measurements of interim progress. We've already seen this in one of the three um, states that, have had, that on Tuesday got their, uh, their letters from the department that, um, that they, ha they have to come back and, and give them this information, which was missing, uh, and that state is Nevada. The, um, and Ricky and I have been pointing out in our um, analyses that there's tremendous amounts of missing information in these draft plans. In fact, it, some of them are missing so much that, uh, you know, we said to one state, North Carolina, we really don't understand why you put this out for comment because there's hardly anything to comment on because everything just had, uh, you know, hold placeholders for we're going to fill this in later, and that's really a disservice to everyone, but most importantly to the to the stakeholders. The department should have, in fact, returned these plans before they sent them to peer review. Um, you know, this shouldn't have been a, a process of peer review to determine what's missing in the plan. Um, and we did want to point out one state, um, the state of Michigan, which took a quite novel approach to their goals, where they, all, they, they only, not only set relatively low um, and unambitious goals, but then they also turned around and said, and we're only going to expect 75% of the schools and the students to achieve these goals. So we, that one we thought was particularly noteworthy. I keep losing my little thing here. And then lastly, um, we are seeing uh, no or, or, or little alignment with the, uh, with the SIPs that the states have been working on through their Indicator 17. Uh, for the most part, we've seen not, no mention of them, and we've been um, mentioning that in our analysis. And there, we've only seen a couple of states that have even alluded to their SIP or, or to their SIMR in their state plan, and we will call out as, as very noteworthy in this regard, the plan from New Mexico, which goes into a great deal of detail on their SIP and their SIMR. So the, there's, a, there's two ways, basically, that states are going about setting their academic achievement goals. The first one is that they're setting the same goal for, at the end of their timeline, whatever that timeline is that they've chosen, uh, they're making the same goal for all student groups. So this is an example. Um, here again, this is a, from New Jersey's plan, and their timeline to achieve this goal is, their, is to school year 20, 29, 20, 30. And you'll see that regardless of the baseline that they're starting with in either English language arts or mathematics in the third column, regardless of the baseline of, of the student subgroup, every group is going to be at 80% in 2029-2030. So for students with disabilities, this means significant improvement um, that in some cases is, is rather hard to, to fathom, but uh, we're showing you the examples of, of what you're going to see in the plans. The other uh, methodology that's being used a lot uh, is this one of Re reducing proficiency gaps, uh, and in this case, reducing the proficiency gap by half by subgroup by the end of the uh, of the the timeline. So this is Delaware's um, submitted plan, and they used this approach. And you, so you can see here that the children with disabilities were starting out at 13 and a half percent proficient, and by 2030, they were going to be just slightly over half of of them would, would be proficient uh, in reading and math using this uh, methodology. Now, I can tell you that um, since we prepared this presentation, Delaware got a letter. One, they were one of those three states that got their letters on first letters that went out on Tuesday, and they have been told to revise these goals that they are that the department does not consider them 
ambitious enough. That was actually quite a surprise to us because this approach is really a, a, a remnant of the ESEA flexibility that the, the department put out under the Obama administration that did a, this was one of the optional ways that they could set proficiency rates. So it was, it's very interesting to now see the department to come and say that they don't, they, they, they find this process unacceptable. Now, there's a whole bunch of draft plans out there that are using this methodology or using one that results in even less ambitious goals. So it'll be interesting to see if those folks go back and change their goals in their draft plans, knowing now that um, the department has taken this position with Delaware. The, the other thing that I wanted to sh uh, show you as an example here is the issue that I pointed out earlier where there's no alignment between the, the proficiency rates and the, and the graduation rates. So for example, in Delaware's plan, their four-year um, graduation rate goal for students with disabilities is 81.9%. 81.9% of students with disabilities are expected to, do, to graduate in four years with a regular high school diploma. Now, we ponder how that can happen when only slightly more than half of them are proficient in reading and math. We've, and I've only seen one state that actually even, even recognized this lack of alignment in their own plan, and i sorry I can't recall which, which state it was, but, um, and the, the explanation that they offered for that lack of alignment is that being proficient in reading and mathematics is not a requirement for a high school diploma. So I'm, I hope that a lot of you are laughing out there, even though I can't hear that, because um, that's pretty sad too. So we're just going to give you a couple of examples of what you're going to see in the goal setting. Now, just in case you're wondering if there's any gap closing going on for students with disabilities, this um, rather complex <laughs> table is out of the just recently re uh, released report from the National Center on Educational Outcomes on publicly reported assessment results for students with disabilities and the, and the compar comparable uh, gaps that they are showing to st students without disabilities on general assessments. It's only general assessments. So we have here uh, five, well, 12 years, basically, um, five years of five sl slices of gaps. Um, and you can see that for the most part, there is no gap closing. Uh, and in fact, there's gap widening, um, particularly in uh, high school, in the area in high school. Now, some of that could be um, the result of in, particularly in, in the most recent years, of states moving to more rigorous standards and, and assessments aligned with those standards. But, but whatever, okay, the, this is uh, what, what we're dealing with with regard to gap closing for students with disabilities. And then when we look at graduation rates, and I have this analysis on my website by state, uh, we now have five years of the regulatory adjusted cohort graduation rate, which was required um, in a 2008 federal regulation. So we now have five years of history of, for students with disabilities, and we can see here that in five years, we have gone from 59% students getting leaving high school in four years with a regular high school diploma to 65%. So we have been, you might see this in some of our analyses where we have been pointing out to states that you know, you're, you're planning to get students with disabilities to a 95% graduation rate, and yet in, in the last four, five years, you've managed to get improved by two or three percentage points, and, you know, we just leave that to them to figure out how they're going to um, accelerate that improvement. Um, the students with disabilities four-year ACGR ranges from a low of 31% in Mississippi, which is a gap of 50 percentage points between students with disabilities and students without disabilities, um, to a high of 82% for students with disabilities in Arkansas, which is a gap of only three, per three percentage points. So there's a huge range of graduation rates across uh, the states for students with disabilities. 
the next piece we're going to talk about is the indicators, the, the, another key uh, component of the ESSA plan. So ESSA requires for states to use the following indicators for, uh, as part of their, their um, state, statewide accountability system. So for elementary and secondary schools that are not high schools, they, they must use their academic achievement indicator, which is measured by proficiency rates um, in reading, language arts, and math. Um, we have seen now um, one of the states, at least one of the states of the three that have already gotten their letters, including other content areas, and they have been told, no, you can't do that. This is reading, language arts, math, no science, no social studies. You can put those things in someplace else in your plan. So that was kind of an interesting development. Um, and then they have to have another academic indicator, which can be a measure of growth, and just about every, every um, elementary and middle school is using uh, a measure of student growth. High schools also have to have their academic achievement indicator and their graduation rate indicator. And they must lay out the four-year graduation rate, and they can also uh, lay out extended year graduation rates if they so choose. And if they do, they have to give us those goals and interim uh, targets on each one of those slices of, uh, of graduation. High schools can use another measure of academic achievement, such as student growth. We're seeing that in some states um, and, and not in others. Um, and then all schools, elementary, middle, high schools, all schools must uh, also use an indicator of uh, progress in achieving English language proficiency. This is a big change in ESSA, um, moving English language proficiency out of Title III into Title I. And, um, and then the last one is a, a um, indicator of school quality or student success that is valid, comparable, and statewide. A lot of people are calling this the fifth indicator. Everybody was very excited about it when ESSA was passed because we were finally going to be given some other opportunity to get away from you know, te test results. And then, of course, we're seeing, um, honestly, very little um, innovation, innovation in, uh, in states in this regard. So our issues that we're finding with the indicators, first of all, many states are, are not assigning weighting to the indicators, and that's a requirement for them from the state, that the states have to tell um, the department how, how much weight they're going to assign to each one of those indicators that I just went through with you. Um, th this is, this is a, um, uh, an, a judgment of, of mine and Ricky's, uh, so it's not a requirement. but that it, but. Our judgment is that many states are assigning too much weight to growth versus proficiency, and they're using student growth percentiles as a growth measure, which only measures growth compared to peers and not growth to proficiency. Uh, we are particularly concerned when there's a, a, a high weight on growth at the secondary level compared to achievement. Uh, because, you know, w once you get to the high school, you're running out of time to have growth, so you need to really get to proficiency. Uh, some states, uh, Connecticut is our favorite, incorporating too many indicators of school quality. This is the fifth indicator. Um, or they have like nine or something. Or, or, on the other hand, many states are using only one. Um, most, A lot of them are using chronic absenteeism. And... Um, the measurement experts that we have, what we look to for guidance on these kinds of things, have indicated that the use of only one element in this fifth indicator can lead to corruption. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as Campbell's law. Uh, that you know, the, the more meaningful you make a single measurement, the more likely it can it can be misused. So, um, so that's a, an area of concern. Uh, some states are including test participation, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, in their indicator mix, uh, which, is, which is basically not allowed. We're, we're hoping that, that the, the department will note that in their reviews. Um, and, OK. So next, next thing we're going to talk about is um, the meaningful, annual meaningful differentiation. This is how the state is going to use their, their statewide accountability system to identify schools in need of performance. 
So in the system, the states have to identify uh, the weighting of each of those indicators, how they, their system will be based on all indicators for all students in each subgroup, relate to those long-term goals that we talked about, and be used to identify schools. And they also have to tell the state how they're going, if they're going to use a different methodology for particular types of schools. Um, and this can be, this is an area of concern for us because these, uh, all these schools can be, um, you know, high schools that have, uh, that, that are called alternative schools that have high percentages of kids with disabilities um, or, or schools only for kids with disabilities. The, um, and we've already seen one state, that's New Mexico, um, in their letter be told um, that they, because they sliced out all of these schools and said they wouldn't be included in their accountability system, so the department has already told them that, no, yes, they will be included, you just have to, you have to tell us how. So that system then needs to be used to identify two big buckets of schools, okay? The first bucket is, um, are schools that need comprehensive support and improvement. And this group of schools has to be identified at least once every three years. And, um, and the state can add other uh, criteria, but these are the three criteria that, of schools that must be identified for comprehensive support and improvement. The first one is not less than the lowest performing 5% of all schools receiving Title I funding. We are seeing states uh, say that they're going to identify their lowest performing 5% of schools. Um, and I think the department called out one, one state already on this because that's, that's not what the law requires. The law requires that, there be, that they identify the lowest performing 5% of schools receiving Title I funding. And that they can certainly identify more schools, but they have to ensure that that, that larger group uh, includes all of the 5% the of Title I schools. The second big uh, element is public high schools failing to graduate one third or more of their students. Um, in other words, a graduation rate of 67% or less. And this is, we've seen here that states are saying, they're going to identify Title I high schools <laughs> failing to graduate one third or more of their students, um, which is not what the law requires. This is all public high schools. Um, as I'm sure many of you know, there's not a lot of high schools that get Title I funding. So that, that's, that's a clearly, uh, was a clear distinction that the lawmakers made here, that this, this pertains to all public high schools. And getting back to my earlier comment about these alternative high schools, um, again, if, if the state is going to find, judge those particular schools in a different manner, then they have to tell the department how that is going to work. But they cannot exclude them because of their particular student population. And then the third, and the third element here is a little bit confusing, and it doesn't, it doesn't kick in until some, until t some title, title I schools have been um, identified in the second next group that I'm, going to, that I'm going to talk about but have failed to improve. So we'll kind of leave that for a moment. So um, the, the second group and the group that we are particularly concerned about and interested in because we think it's going to be the place where uh, students with disabilities as a subgroup uh, can be highlighted and identified and that's the group of schools that will be in need of targeted support and improvement. So these schools, okay, are schools that have one or more subgroup that are consistently underperforming. And uh, consistently underperforming is a term that's defined in the state plan. Um, and you'll see in our analyses that we go to great extent to talk about whether, how we feel about the, de the, the state's definition of consistently underperforming. In many cases, we find it far too uh, stringent and far too um, lengthy in time uh, for, for um, it to really have any impact. The other thing that's important to remember here is that, as Ricky talked about with, this, with, the, with the end size, this is where end size 
it comes into play. If the end size is so large that there's significant numbers of schools that are not accountable for their students with disabilities subgroup, then they will not be in the mix of these of schools that could, in fact, be subject to the identification for targeted support and improvement. So the first, the first is the consistently underperforming subgroup, and the second one is uh, schools that have one or more subgroups that are low performing, which means they're performing as poorly as the all student group in the lowest performing 5% of Title I schools. And that's an identification that needs to happen every three years. So a couple of issues with regard to school identification that we've identified in our analyses. Uh, many states are not providing details on methodologies on uh, how they're going to, in fact, do these identifications. That's already been called out in their letters so far. Uh, many students, as, as I mentioned earlier, are, are excluding schools with high percentages of special education students. And as I said, that's not allowable. Um, they can be, there can be a different approach, but they can't be excluded. Many states are not including high schools with graduation rate of 67% or below only below 67%, so we lose the 67% mark. Uh, many schools are, are using multiple graduation rate uh, for identification, which, which minimizes the primacy of, four, of the four-year graduation rate. And um, I'm sure that all of you know that, um, that the Obama administration had promulgated uh, regulations for accountability for, under ESSA and then the new administration uh, and the Congress um, revoked those, um, those federal regulations. Um, and one of the important pieces in that, in that federal regulation was that uh, in the school identification for comprehensive improvement, the, the state was only to use the four-year adjusted graduation rate and uh, we've seen since, since that regulation was repealed that um, all the states now are, have, are choosing to use a, some kind of mixture of the four-year and the extended year gra graduation rates. And we feel this is, this is particularly uh, unfortunate. Um, this is a particularly unfortunate thing that we lost in the regulations, that we've lost now the, the attention to the four-year graduation rate, the on-time graduation rate for all students and for students with disabilities. The uh, federal regulations also had provided us, fortunately, we had asked for this, with some clarity on how you count students in the subgroups in in ESSA that are what I consider to be kind of transient subgroups, you know, subgroups that students can move in and out of. We had been asking the department to, to clarify for some, for some years exactly who um, uh, would be counted as a, in the students with disabilities subgroup. And we, in fact, had uh, made some recommendations to them on that, and, uh, which they didn't take. Uh, but they did make the clarification in the federal regulations that, that the students who were counted in these subgroups, um, students with disabilities, English learners, uh, low-income students, would, would be, were to be a student, any student who had spent any time at all in that subgroup in their years in the cohort. So if over a four-year period a student spent, you know, two days in, um, with ID eligibility, they were going to be counted in the um, students with disability subgroup for their um, graduation rate. We've lost that clarification now as part of the repeal of the federal regulation. So it's, it remains now unclear how, stu how states are counting these students in this subgroup. Uh, I've lost my thing again. OK. Um, oh. Did I go too far? Yeah, I went way too far. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I didn't. I hadn't finished my my slide before. I'm sorry. I can't see this. Can I go back? Sorry. Okay. 
Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, our next issue on school identification is the definition of consistently underperforming subgroups, often not well defined. I, I touched on this a minute ago. Uh, we, we're seeing, you know, states that are requiring three years of poor performance for identification, and the subgroup has to be low performing on all of the indicators. So, you know, if you if you com combine all of those uh, requirements. Um, and add in the impact of uh, a large end size, we end up with um, the, the, the school identification for targeted support and improvement really not having a lot of meaning for kids with disabilities or for any other subgroup for that matter. And we've already seen one, one state that is inappropriately setting a limit on the percentage of schools that can be targeted for, um, for that can be identified for targeted support and improvement, and you can see there who that is. Okay. So um, here's here's what happens once these these um, the state identifies these two bu bunch buckets of schools for improvement, um, and the role of the school district really comes into play here. So the school district is the one who develops the improvement plan uh, to improve student outcomes in the identified schools. And that plan has to be informed by all of the indicators, including the student performance against the long-term goals. Uh, and includes evidence-based interventions. Um, and evidence-based interventions is now defined by ESSA. Uh, and so I'm, and I'm sure that uh, the AUCD folks will be particularly interested in that definition and in um, some of the work that's going on in states with regard to how they will go about <clears throat> providing school districts with, uh, ev with what they can choose from with regard to evidence-based interventions. Um, <clears throat> the next requirement is that um, this, there, there be a, a needs assessment um, conducted at the school level, that they identify resource inequities, and that the plan is approved by the school, the LEA, and the SEA, and is monitored periodically by the SEA. The issue we know here is that, that states are not focusing their interventions on the subgroups that resulted in the identification of the school. So that's an important piece to the work. Okay. Next and very important for us, very important in our reviews of state plans, is this annual measurement of achievement. Uh, we knew this under NCLB as the 95% participation rule for, uh, and it was a part of adequate yearly progress um, that in fact had a much stronger uh, presence in the accountability system under No Child Left Behind. Um, it was somewhat compromised in the uh, in the waiver uh, process, and now is um, is being is being further compromised under ESSA. Uh, so, ne although ESSA has maintained the requirement that at least 95% of all students and each subgroup participate in annual state assessments uh, in reading and math, and of course, IDEA also requires that students with disabilities be be included in all state assessments. ESSA requires states to factor this requirement into their accountability system. And that's all it says, is that they have to factor it in. The one thing that, they, that states do have to do, however, is in calculating proficiency on, test, um, on, on their state assessments, once the test participation rate falls below 95%, students not tested must be counted as non-proficient. In other words, they cannot remove non-tested non students from their calculation. I'm going to go very quickly here because we're running out of time. Uh, so a couple of issues that we're seeing with regard to annual measurement of, of achievement. Um, states are not providing any meaningful way test participation is being factored in. Uh, they're just doing some kind of uh, obligatory lowering of the, of the score that's not meaningful. They're using much higher end sizes for participation. Um, they are not recognizing the requirement to test, to, to count untested students as non-proficient. Uh, and that's 
worrying us that they're, uh, they're not understanding that requirement in ESSA and therefore might not carry it out. And one state is only measuring all students in high needs groups, not student subgroups. So, um, and then one state proposes to, to publish two sets of achievement data, one with uh, without counting the, the non-participants as non-proficient. So we 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 were concerned that that's going to lead to um, a lot of misunderstanding about the provision. Um, Kim, I'm going to skip over these last two, if that's OK, that people can read them in their handout sure. so that we can do our poll and then have some time for questions. Sounds okay. good. OK. So Anna, can you do our poll? Mm -hmm. Okay. So we wanted to ask you how involved have you been in development of your state's ESSA plan um, using one of these three answers, not at all somewhat involved or very involved. Do I have to do mine? My state doesn't have a plan yet, so. Are they, are they voting? They are voting. Um, okay. <laughs> I can... Um, so it shows that 82% uh, not at all, 14% somewhat involved, and 5% very involved. Okay. Well, if those 5% want to help us analyze state plans, they're well, <laughs> welcome to join us. Okay. Cool. And you know we've we have done this poll with um, with the parent training and information centers and gotten very very similar results. And as Ricky said earlier, it's you know, it's tragic that we're we we're um, seeing nothing but really a bunch of lip lip service given to whether uh, stakeholders who would represent the interests of students with disabilities have been included in the development of state planning. So, Kim, do you want to, do you have questions? That's yeah, um, okay. we'll open it up, but I'd, I'll be the, I'd like to, uh, since I have the microphone, I'll, I'll be the first to ask a question. How, um, how should or could our network be more involved? What are, can you provide a couple of tips? You've provided some great resources for us, and I really appreciate that. Um, but what, what steps that should they be taking right now? Well, I mean, what I tell the families I represent is that they need, you know, it depends on where your plan is in the process. If right. they are just putting out, a, they haven't even put out a draft yet, is, you know, to contact your State Department of Education. Say that, you know, you're a major group in your state representing disability and that you want to be engaged in the process of that plan development. I mean, even if your plan has been put out there already and you're moving along at any point, it's not too late to say, you know, you need to involve us in the process and to be looking for some of the key pieces that we've brought up today, end size being a big one, um, participation rate. We do have that state plan review guide for you so that you could look through that. And you could use that both for what you what is important to see in your plan if you haven't seen a draft yet, as well as analyzing your drafts, making sure when your state has public meetings that you get out there at those public meetings that you know you're commenting when there's an opportunity to comment on those drafts. Um, a lot of states are just having one 30-day comment period, and then they go back and they change things, and if you're see and then they don't come back to you. So if you're seeing major holes in your plan, things missing that we've talked about here, you know you need to argue that you know they need to update it and put that information in there and redline it, by the way, and then bring it back for public comment because you can't really provide input on a plan that's missing a lot of the elements. So, Candace, more? Yeah, well, I would just add that, you know, uh, uh, we don't think that, um, or at least so far, we have, we have not concluded that there is any stage of this game uh, that brings an end to stakeholder involvement. And in fact, 
when we when we got saw and reviewed the three letters that went out on Tuesday to three states, one of those we had reviewed all of those states, okay, uh, but one of the states, Delaware, as I mentioned during my presentation, was told um, that they had to revise their long-term goals. Well, that's a significant change to a plan, and um, you know, so that that work should involve stakeholders. So we went immediately to the Parent Training and Information Center in Delaware and said, you know, heads up, this is what's happened. And we would suggest that you contact your State Department and tell them you are aware of what they've been directed to do and that you want to be included in that conversation. And, and they did that. And so, you know, I'm, I think that even, what, even when the states get their peer review letters or their predetermination letters or whatever the, whatever the department's calling them, um, uh, that's that's not too late a stage to um, to be involved. So, I mean, the sooner the better. But wherever your yeah. state is, you can still get yourself involved. The other thing is that there are LEA plans as well as state plans, and this is another place. And if you go on the Advocacy Institute website, we have an LEA document, and that's also important because that's where if you're not seeing the evidence-based practices that you believe are important in your state plan, that's another place to have these is in your LEA plans. Does that help out? Help, hope you, Kim? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, are there any questions from those of you on the line? So, uh, Kim, there are three questions in the question box, and we have two hands raised. Um, I know we're past the time, but I, I want to know how you'd like to handle it. Uh, am I supposed to see them? I only see one regarding handouts. Uh, there's just three more. If you scroll. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't see them. Can you, uh, sure. can you hear them? Um, I mean, can you uh, go ahead and say them, ask them? No problem. So how much impact on development of the state plans has occurred in light of passage, passage Public Law 115.13? What's 115.13? <laughs> uh, oh, here. 115.13 is entitled Providing for Congressional Disapproval under Chapter 8, United States Code. Oh, the Congressional Review Act. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, they yeah. Use, that's that's what they use to repeal the accountability regulations. You know, and and that covered also what goes into state plans. So a lot of the the specificity and and options that were guide especially guides to states that you can do this or this or this or something equally rigorous, um, all that went away. So it, it gave us. You know, when we were reviewing these plans, we were saying you have to do this or this or this. You know, we lost some of that ability to say some of those, some of those things when we lost the uh, regulations. We have one more question uh, that is, is there a standard used, used to determine alignment of state standards to assessment for those on IEPs? Alignment of state standards two assessments. Um, well, the, the one thing that, you know, I have been drawing out uh, that's important, and the CCSSO put out a, a document, too, uh, that uh, talked about this, and, th and that is the guidance that was put out um, in November of 2015, was it, um, that, uh, we, about standards-based IEPs. And that essentially the department said that, uh, you know, as far as, they, as far as they were concerned, their interpretation of FAPE was an access to the general curriculum was a standards-based IEP. So uh, I offer that to, uh, for, the, and, for the question. And also um, in terms of whether or not a state assessment is being aligned properly to the standards, which, you know, I was thinking that's what the question was asking. Oh. Um, there is a separate, but I'm not, Maybe I'm wrong about that. But there is a separate peer review process for assessment. Right. right. And that is where, hopefully, you know, peer reviewers would raise if there is not proper alignment and, and comment on, on that to the state. But that's, that's a separate process from this. The only thing in the state plan around assessments 
in these applications. So they're really focusing a lot on the, you know, language assessments in other languages and the math assessment. And you know, there was a lot more about assessments in the plan um, in the last version of the application before this one, unfortunately. There are a lot of requirements that are not reflected in the plan. For example, all assessments are supposed to be developed using universal design for learning. In fact, the plan is supposed to say how it develops their alternate assessments using UDL, but that somehow is not in this template. So there are a lot more requirements than what the template is asking the state to talk about that it's important in your state you know, you know about, because whether they say it in the plan or not, they're still required to do it. One of them being making sure they don't exceed 1% when they do the alternate assessments that we bring out, point out in our analyses. And there's, they really should have strategies in their plan for how are they going to make sure they stay below that. Thank you. Um, do we have time? I want to be um, respectful of our presenters. Um, do you have time for one more question? Oh, sure. Yeah. The last question is, there's, is there a state that has a good plan or a good uh, for a month that they can use? <laughs> you know, that's that's a great question, and, you know, we get it all the time. And, um, uh, you know, as I said to Ricky the other day, it's kind of like being asked, um, and, and the women out there will understand this, kind of being like asked to describe the perfect lover. Um, and, and and it would be a little of this guy you knew in high school and a little of this guy you knew in college, <laughs> you know. But there is, there is no one plan. Uh, the best that we could do would be to give you, you know, the, the specific um, pieces uh, uh, by provision that we think are re rather exemplary or at least satisfactory, but they, they would span, you know, would be some, something from, uh, you know, New Mexico, something from New Jersey, something from Oregon. Uh, I you mean, know, an example... Example of that is that New Hampshire, we just reviewed New Hampshire, and New Hampshire has an extraordinarily well-stated section on universal design for learning. It has everything my little heart could desire around UDL, but then it has atrociously low goals. Right. So, right. you know, it's, it is a mixed bag within each plan of the things that might be good and the things that are not so good. And that's why, you know, we have, you know, at the risk of, you know, calling out states, um, and, ma and many of the states that we have listed uh, within those issues are, are those, were, those were states that emerged through their draft plan, okay? So we, we want to be clear that a lot of our analyses have been based on drafts, not on, on submitted plans. But um, that's why we've listed specific states where, in, in a lot of cases, where we've identified issues or where we've identified, you know, certainly not as much as we should have done, but in cases where we've identified states that we feel have done an exemplary job of um, speaking to the, the SIP and um, even our, our results-driven accountability, and that being New Mexico, and, and, and hardly any other state doing that specific. So. Great. That looks like that we have all our questions have been answered. So um, I want to thank. Uh, I'll pass it over to Kim to close us. So okay. Kim, could I could, could I just could I just add one thing? Yes. Uh, quickly, and that is that I want people to know because we certainly don't have time to talk about this, and we really even haven't addressed it in our analyses. But I do want people to know that there there were significant changes made by ESSA to McKinney Vinto. And, and in fact, those changes were all effective last October. And you know, uh, the, the latest report out of the um, Homeless uh, Resource Center indicated that the kids with IEPs are the fastest growing segment of homeless children. So we do need to understand the overlap of these populations, just as we gave you the overlap of Title I and students with disabilities. So, um, and we have webinars on our website um, about ESSA changes with regard to homeless, foster care and students in juvenile um, facilities and 
So I would just invite people to... And there's the significant cognitive disabilities. And, and Ricky did one on significant cognitive disabilities, and then there's one by Martha Thurlow on the history of including students with disabilities in, in statewide assessments, which is, which is just superb. So I would, incur, I would you know, invite people to, to look at all those. They're not very long, and so just wanted to say that. All right, thank you both. And then also, uh, on the invitation to this webinar, we included links to their, uh, their guides to uh, the state plan review guide and advocacy tips. And, or just go to advocacyinstitute.org and go to the ESSA page or ndsscenter.org and uh, click political advocacy. And there are many, many fantastic resources. So we thank you both so much for the time you've taken to help AUCD's network um, understand how to get more involved. And I hope now they will uh, uh, become more involved. And we will um, put the archive of this webinar on our website so that more people can get this great information. Um, so thank you again for all those of you um, out there who have participated. And uh, we'll make sure that you uh, get the links to the information if you didn't get it already. Thank you. All right. See you guys at the Education Task Force. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.